to um, go ahead and get started while people are filtering in. Um, thank you for being here for the second installment of our um, guest speaker, Dr. Tyrone Howard. Um, we are very lucky to have Dr. Howard with us. Um, just some housekeeping items. Uh, there is a question and answer. Um, so if you have a question that you would like Dr. Howard to um, address, please put that in the Q&A. Um, the chat will go to the panelists. So if you have something that you would like to send to either myself or my colleague, Dr. Ramirez, who is also here on this call, you are welcome to put something in the chat to us. Um, if you raise your hand, we will ask you that you put the question into the chat. So please make sure that we're using that function. Um, and tonight we are focusing on our secondary students, which is kind of cool because, um, you know, it's very different to have a conversation with elementary students versus secondary students. Um, before we begin, I would like to just talk a little bit about Dr. Howard's background. Um, we're lucky to have him here. Uh, Dr. Howard is a professor in the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies at UCLA, um, also the inaugural director of the UCLA Pritzker um, Center for Strengthening Children and Families, which is the transdisciplinary consortium of experts who examine academic, mental health, and social emotional experiences and challenges for the California's most vulnerable youth populations. He's also the director of the UCLA Transformation of Schools, would serve as a thought partner for districts, counties, and states to pursue the whole child, whole community um, approaches to school systems improvement. And he's published over 85 peer-reviewed journals, articles, and books, um, and technical reports. And he's published several best-selling books, among them Why Race and Culture Matter in Schools and Black Mailed, Peril and Promise in the Education of African-American Males. His two most recent books, No More Teaching Without Positive Relationships and All Students Must Thrive, Transforming Schools to Combat uh, Toxic Stressors and Cultivate Cultural Wellness, um, have become must-reads for all educators. Dr. Howard is considered one of the premier experts on educational equity and access in the country. Dr. Howard is also the director and founder of the Black Male Institute at UCLA, which is an interdisciplinary cadre of scholars, practitioners, community members, and policymakers dedicated to examining the nexus of race class and gender of school age youth. A native and former classroom teacher of Compton, California, Dr. Howard was named the recipient of the 2015 UCLA Ding Distinguished Teaching Award, which is the campus's highest honor for teaching excellence, and was named an American Educational Research Association Fellow in 2017 for his exemplary research on race and equity. During the last five years, Dr. Howard has been listed by Education Week as one of the 60 most influential scholars in the nation informing educational policy, practice, and reform. So I would like to turn it over to Dr. Howard and thank everyone for being here tonight so we can hear um, you know, all of his expertise and, and have a really great conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Gotanda. My pleasure, my honor. Thank you also, Dr. Ramirez. We see your name. We don't see you, but we know you're a part of this as well. It's my honor and my privilege to be here with you all this evening to engage in what I think is one of the more important types of conversations that we can engage with our young people, and that is the discussions around race and racism. Uh, I can't say how, um, how honored I've been to be engaged with uh, Palos Verde in, in terms of just the willingness to talk uh, about these very difficult and challenging issues, the willingness to, to really take some risk, which is what uh, I'm gonna ask you all to do today. Uh, I wanna give a big shout to, uh, she's my former student, but I, I my, but she's kind of, I always say you want your student to go on to be bigger and better than the, the teacher. So Dr. Dr. G is someone who I have the utmost respect for, and she has been a trailblazer in helping uh, us to think about these issues and, and not just think, but also to do better around these issues. And let me be clear, at the outset, that as we talk about these issues with race and racism, um, we all, present company included, can be better. We all can be better. Uh, I'm the father of four children. I have made my, my share of mistakes in this, in this domain, uh, like I'm sure many of you have. But the goal of this conversation is how do we get better? And how do we understand? And how do we recognize that this is a this is a evolving situation? Our schools, as I'll talk about in a second, and our society are becoming more diverse with each passing day. And we have to be better. Uh, we need to be better. And it takes work. And it takes practice. And it's not something we're going to just figure out in one conversation. So I look look forward to to, to engaging you. I see some phenomenal questions already in the chat. I mean, in the Q and A. So you all are really fired up and ready to go as well. What I'll try to do is to try to address some of these questions as I present, but then hopefully we can live a little time at the end so if we can be more direct about these. And so at, at any point in time, um, you know, what I, what I oftentimes tell folks in these conversations, because they can be very 
touchy at times. They can be very, um, they can be hard to digest at times. I've got a new little approach. Whenever something is said that really causes someone to feel a little bit uneasy or uncomfortable, ouch, ouch. That's the magic word. So at any point in time today, as I'm talking, if I say something that really caused you to feel uneasy or uncomfortable, say, ouch, that's my cue that, okay, there's something that didn't set well or something that someone may have some curiosity about because I'm gonna challenge you today. I'm gonna challenge us all to be better. And I'm gonna kind of poke us all to be better because I think that these issues matter. Uh, these issues are important. Uh, and part of what I oftentimes frame this conversation around is how do we, as a country, as a society that we say we live in a democratic society that's about inclusivity, that's about diversity, uh, that's about equality. How do we live up to those lofty goals so that no person feels uh, any less than than another person? So I'm ready to, to, to delve into our conversation today. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so we can get started. Uh, and again, this is, I think, gonna be a, a, a really phenomenal conversation because we're tailoring it to our older students, right? And I think that so much of this is about developmental appropriateness uh, and in our previous conversation, we kind of covered the gamut, you know, how do we talk with the little ones about it uh, compared to how do we talk to the older uh, ones about it. But today we're going to focus in on just what I call our tweens and teens because they're much more sophisticated intellectually. They're much more mature in terms of their awareness. And let me say this from the outset, like I said, as a father for myself, I continue to be amazed at the depths of what young people know and understand and can articulate about very complex issues. Uh, as much as we may not want to admit it, folks, they would run circles around us intellectually in terms of where they are today compared to where we were years ago. It's hard for us to say that. It's hard for us to recognize that. But when you sit and listen and you have conversations with young people today, I am just, my, my mind is blown away at the ability to articulate and to, to relate and to connect and to make, you know, connections with some of these really heavy issues. So um, this is going to be something I think we all can think about. Uh, many of you are probably already doing many of these things I'm going to discuss today. So if you are, continue doing them. Uh, for some of you, you may be coming to this saying, I'm just at a loss. I'm not, I'm not sure what to do. And hopefully you can walk away with some tools and strategies that can be useful. So let's get into it. I, I first start off to each and every one of you who are here today with a big thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you are already halfway home in terms of being better at this because you're here. Uh, you could have chosen to do lots of other things, be lots of other places. It's around the dinner time, but you are here to learn and to grow and to get more information on how to be better. So for that, I am eternally, eternally grateful. I'm appreciative. Uh, and again, I hope that we make this well worth your time. So thank you for being here and, and thank you for being part of our information exchange. So the, the question that, that guides us is how do we talk about race? How do we talk about racism? And part of what I oftentimes have to try to help people understand, because I spend a lot of my time studying these issues, studying these trends, helping folks to recognize that issues of race are all around us. Uh, and we have to recognize that we can't just sort of bury our heads in the sand, um, that we have to be willing to confront, address, talk about these issues because they matter and they're important. And it's the world we live in. And we live in Southern California, folks. We live in one of the most racially and ethnically and culturally and linguistically diverse places in the entire world. So we have the beauty of being able to say that diversity is all around us. Diversity is something we should be proud of. I think diversity is our strength. I think diversity is something we should honor and something we should uh, talk to our, our kids about in terms of why we are better when we are more diverse. Because I think what would our society look like if we all looked the same, talked the same, uh, had the same thoughts, had the same beliefs? That's not how we evolve as a society. We evolve when we have different viewpoints, different perspectives, different worldviews, different sets of realities. That's the beauty of diversity. And I think one of our most basic tenets of diversity is racial and ethnic background, because that's what we see when we come into contact with people. I'm gonna give a few slides that I shared with folks last time I was here. And so it'll be a bit redundant for the first few minutes, but it's just to bring folks in who may not have been part of our first conversation. Why this conversation? Because demographics tell us we have to recognize where we are as a country. I shared this slide last time, I'm gonna walk through it real quickly, but if you look at just the makeup of schools from a racial and ethnic standpoint, 
for years, for years in this country, we were overwhelmingly white as a, as a, as a, as a student population. From 1900 to 1970, most of our students were white. So when we said minority students, we typically meant non-white. And for th today's purpose, when I say non-white, I'm referring to African-American, uh, Latinx or, or Latino populations, Asian American, Asian Pacific Islanders, uh, or uh, indigenous or Native American populations, okay? Uh, but as I mentioned last time we talked, in 2016, 2017, the nation witnessed something that it had never seen before in our student makeup. For the first time in the nation, we enrolled more non-white kindergartners than we did white kindergartners. Demographers have been seeing that coming for some time, but they thought it would happen around 2021, about five years sooner than we had anticipated. We saw a major shift where we're seeing more non-white students enrolling in kindergarten. And every year since, that number has only gone up more, okay? And so what the demographers tell us now is that what we'll see as a nation is something that will look very different for us in years to come. This is what the makeup will be of our schools racially and ethically by the year 2030. By the year 2030, that's only a brief nine years away, okay? We'll see the largest subgroup of students in our schools and nationally will be Latino students. Second largest will be whites. Whites will go from about 52% nationally right now to about 30% in a brief time. The immigrant population will continue to rise. Our black and Asian population will be about 10% and mixed race, one of the fastest growing groups, will be about 5%. Our indigenous population is still less than 1%. I wanted to mention that, but part of what we have to do is recognize that this is the America that our students are going to live in. This is the America that our students are going to go to college in. This is the America that our students are gonna work in. So the sooner we can help our students learn how to live and, and work and laugh and, and, and engage across racial and ethnic differences, the better off they'll be. There's all kinds of research about the benefits of diversity, that our students grow and learn and they do better when they're in diverse school settings. The challenge is that unfortunately for far too many of our students, they tend to grow up in largely racially segregated communities. Most of the communities where our kids live and go to school tend to be of one or two primarily sort of ethnic or racial groups. For many of our students, the first time they really experience some real sort of integrated diversity, happens to come when they come to college. And so again, I'll sort of build on this point of what the institution that I work at, UCLA, uh, looks like, just to give you a snapshot. Uh, UCLA, like most of the other UCs, are made up of mostly non-white students. Uh, when you think about sort of the balance of ethnic and racial diversity that we see at a place like UCLA, we see it at, at all the other public institutions across the state. We see it in the privates. We see it in places like USC, Pepperdine. We're seeing a significant shift in terms of the diversity of our colleges in the state of California. I also show that when we look at even our Ivy League schools, they're seeing something similar happening where the majority of students are non-white. So part of what we frame this discussion around is the fact that our schools are changing because our nation is changing. So in many ways for us not to engage in these conversations would be a missed opportunity because where our students are going to be, where they're gonna learn, where they're gonna work, where they're gonna live, is going to continue to be comprised of ethnic and racial diversity. So that's why we all have to be better. And I'll say this later on in the, in the presentation, but in many ways, our students are much more advanced on some of these issues than we are as adults. Right, Because when you think about it, we are much more advanced around these issues, around discussing and talking diversity compared to our parents. Each generation tends to be a little bit more at ease, a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more knowledgeable about how to talk about, think about, and really engage in these hard conversations around race and racism. So there you see the sort of the, the landscape of where, we are, where we're going, where we are. But again, part of what we know is that many of us avoid talking about race at all costs. We just don't know how to do it. We just don't want to do it. We're afraid of stepping on toes. We don't know what's the, you know, the politically appropriate terms to use. We don't want to come off as being racist. Uh, we don't want to say something that might be considered prejudicial. All these things kind of inform our fears, right? Or we hear about a story where someone had questions and the questions that they asked came across as highly uh, sort of problematic. So part of what we have to recognize that we have mechanisms that we use. 
we have mechanisms that we use when we choose not to talk about race. And one of the things that we have to think about is how this work starts with us first. Some deep seated reflections, some deep seated sort of introspection about what were the messages that we learned about race growing up. Who were the voices? Who were the people who shaped and informed our understandings about race, right? And not only do we have to start with us in terms of some deep introspection, we also have to ask what's our defense mechanism when issues of race come up? Because we all have them, right? And our defense mechanisms have to be thought about because they send some powerful messages to our students to our young people, and they oftentimes use some of those same mechanisms. So let's kind of talk about some of the mechanisms we might use. Part of it is we don't wanna see the matrix. The matrix in this case is race and racism. We're gonna say, let's not act as if it's there. Let's not see it. Let's not see it. Let's try to avoid it. Let's look over it. Let's look under it. Let's look sort of through it if we can. Let's not see the matrix, but we have to see the matrix that is race because like I mentioned a moment ago, it's all around us. So what are our defense mechanisms when we come into contact with issues of race? Oftentimes our, react, our reactions to seeing the matrix fall in some of these categories, right? We go into our flight or fight or freeze response. Some of us are like jackrabbits. The minute issues of race come up, we go running for the door. We saw that we head out. We don't want to be around. Let me get out before this conversation starts. Our kids bring it up. We try to find something to, to, to distract us. We move away and we just don't wanna be a part of the, the, the conversation. For some of us, that mechanism is like the porcupine. We get very prickly about it and we say, how dare you even suggest that I can't talk about racist issues because I'm not a racist. And we get very sort of uh, sensitive about the fact that people might even raise the question that we're not able to have these conversations. Some of us become the turtle. We just put our heads into our shells and say, you know what? I just don't see color. I this I see people. And we're going to talk about why that can be problematic, right? Some of us become the pilots and we just freeze and we stay, we sit still and we say, you know what? I think people of color should talk about that. I'm not going to talk about it if I'm not a person of color. And we're just there, but we're not really active, we're not really engaged, and we're not even a participant, right? Some of us become, you know, very much about fighting like a lion or a tiger might, right? And we completely deny any wrongdoing. And the fact that you even raise this question to me about me is a sign of reverse racism. We get very sort of aggressive and defensive and we fight to defend our honor, right? Uh, some of us try to just blend in and, and be, become like the chameleon. We kind of go with the wind. We kind of go whatever the tone or the tenor is of the conversation. If it's an inclusive conversation, we're there. If it's not, of an, not an inclusive conversation, we're with those folks. So part of what we have to recognize, what is our defense mechanism about race? What does it speak to in us and how can we be better? Because in so many ways, our kids, even as tweens and teens, pick up on our cues. They mimic our cues. They may even, in some ways, challenge us about our cues because many of us were not taught how to have these conversations. Many of us were taught by our parents just to avoid it. Many of us were taught by our parents to just push back and challenge anyone who even brought up these conversations. So it starts with us, with this reflection, real sort of deep thought processes about our childhood, about our high school years, about what we knew, what were our neighborhoods like? Did we have many friends who were different racially and ethnically from us? What were our experiences as high schoolers where we wanted the only kids of our racial or ethnic background? What was the neighborhood like? What were my social circles like? All of it starts with us, right? To, to really understand that our reality is our reality. But in many ways, what we cannot do, what we should not do, is juxtapose our realities on our children because their realities are different. Times change, circumstances are different. As I mentioned earlier, they're a much more savvy group of young people than we could have ever been at the same age. So know our defense mechanism and let's think about them, okay? So let me walk you through something that we have to understand. Racism is a learned reality. And just like we learn it, we can unlearn it. No one is born into the world racist. No one is born into the world sort of filled with dislike or distaste for people who are different from them. Um, a real powerful book for me that helped to open my eyes uh, about racism and discrimination and prejudice was a book that was written by uh, uh, an author named Gordon Allport called The Nature of Prejudice. And what he does is he explains that prejudice is basically to judge before knowing, to pre 
judge, hence prejudice. And he says that it's part of the human condition. We all do it, right? We form opinions. We come to conclusions oftentimes in split seconds without having much information to help us even think about why we think that because we're sort of filled with all these images and all these stereotypes and all these beliefs that are all around us. And he says, just like we learn that stuff, we can unlearn it. So one of the goals here is to help us unlearn it for ourselves and hopefully help our own children unlearn it as well. Because again, prejudice, racism, discrimination are learned realities. So three things that Allport talks about for us to get better is first of all, for us to stop. Sometimes we're going hundred miles an hour. We tend to just kind of come to some quick conclusions, slow down, reflect. Why do I think this about that particular person? Why do I say this about that particular group? Why have I oftentimes said some not so healthy things about that particular group of people? Why am I having some fear when I see people who look that way coming into my neighborhood or walking by me? And then to react and attempt to be better in some way. So part of what Allport talks about is how we can begin to stop, reflect, and react to be better, okay? And part of that is we're going to talk about in a minute, how can we avoid being colorblind, okay? But let me walk you through the nature of prejudice of why we have to be intentional with talking to our kids, because if we don't interrupt some of the beliefs that they may have early enough, it becomes more difficult and more challenging over time. So one of the things Gordon Allport talked about in this earth shattering book that he wrote back in 1955, that's how long ago he was trying to help us unlearn prejudice. He says that there's this hierarchy of prejudicial actions. And he talked about these five key steps. I'm going to give you just a brief overview of them before I go into some things we must do. So he says that there's five steps that oftentimes are tied to what we do if we're not being thoughtful and reflective. So the first one he talks about is anti-locution, okay? And I promise you, I'm going to not bore you with the details of this, but anti-locution are these jokes, comments, off-the-cuff remarks that we oftentimes hear, we laugh about, or we make in our very tight circles about particular racial groups. We think it's not a big deal person so-and-so told a joke about X group or said something about Y group and we kind of laughed or it made me kind of uncomfortable. It's not a big deal. It's just only a joke. It's not a big deal. Allport says oftentimes it's those little innuendos and those comments and those jokes that oftentimes are the seeds of prejudice, right? And part of what he says is that if we don't snip that in the bud there, that anti-locution can then become a voice where now all of a sudden it's not jokes about those people it's we don't wanna be around those people, right? We rather inconvenience ourselves than to have those people in our presence. We don't want those people in our neighborhood. We don't want those people in the places that we shop or frequent because we have somehow bought into a negative stereotype about those people. And you can fill in that blank with whatever group of people we're talking about. They can be uh, black people, they can be Asian folks, they can be uh, folks who are Latino, right? Whoever those folks are, right? So we avoid. And then he says, if we don't disrupt the avoidance, it turns into a discrimination. Where all of a sudden we're denying people the opportunity to have something that they would normally have the right to have access to. We deny them the opportunity for jobs or we deny them the opportunities for uh, educational opportunities. We deny them uh, access to say living in a particular neighborhood. We have a history of redlining, residential redlining in our country. So we deny people the opportunity to participate fully in a democratic society. And if we don't stop the discrimination, it can turn into physical attacks. And I wish I would have shared the data with you today, but we are seeing that the number of hate crimes here in Los Angeles County, where we live, we consider ourselves to be a progressive county, a progressive city, a progressive, progressive state. Hate crimes have continued to rise in our state over the past four years. And the number one type of hate crime that we see in our state is race-based hate crimes. So physical attacks and racial-based hate crimes are still happening because we don't nip it in the bud early enough. And then what Allport talks about, if we don't stop the avoidance and the discrimination, it can result in physical attack, or in the most extreme cases, it becomes extermination. Think about what happened to the Jews in Germany, right? Holocaust, a complete wiping out of a group of people because we have sort of constructed a stereotype, a negative one about a group of people that positions them as being unworthy of even existing. 
Now that's the extreme case, but we have unfortunately examples of that that have happened in our society. So that's why we have to have these conversations with our, 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 our young people, because if we don't stop it, it continues to evolve and it can get worse and it can be harmful and it can be destructive and it can be in my mind, what I would consider to be very much anti-American. That's not who we say we wanna be, okay? So as we think about these ways in which it plays itself out, we need to understand the culprits. And so for many of you, you know, these images right here are where many of our tweens and teens are getting their information from, right? You pick one of these different icons here, and that's where our young people are spending lots of hours of the day. They are engaged in either their social media, where they get lots of images and messages via Twitter, Snapchat, Pinterest, you name it, YouTube. Uh, they don't do Facebook anymore because that's for the old folks like us. Uh, uh, you know, Instagram, right? These are, social media is one of the primary mechanisms where our kids learn and hear lots of information. One of the things you can start doing is asking your kids about their social media, what the messages are, what they consume, what are their peers talking about? Because you'd be surprised at how much of that stuff kind of filters into our kids' minds that may be very contrary to what we want them to understand. Video games are a big, big area as well. We see more and more data that tells us that our kids are consumed with either phone time via social media, video games, or, you know, movies, which is on the far left. Movies and, and other forms of media, music sends a powerful message. Uh, sports, if our kids are inv involved in any kind of sports, they're hearing lots of these messages. Uh, TikTok is huge, the kinds of messages that can be sent there. So part of what I ask us to think about is where are our kids being socialized? What are they hearing? And how do we begin to make some sense out of the places that they are sort of coming to their own understanding around race and racism? And the big one, which we'll talk about at the bottom is current events. Um, our young people are finding out about current events through social media uh, in ways that we never could have imagined, right? And so we need to be able to sort of engage them in these conversations because there's lots of information. Some of it is good. A whole lot of it is not so good. And I think this is where as parents, we need to be a little bit more sort of introspective, okay? So how do we begin to have these conversations? Let's dig into it. I talked before about the fact that for many white children, there is oftentimes uh, a reluctance or an unwillingness for them to know or understand issues around race because the data tells us that many white families don't discuss race and racism to the degree that parents of color do because parents of color tend to have these conversations because of their own experiences or because as a protective mechanism. So part of what we can do is to start these conversations is that for some white people, not all, for some, there can be issues of guilt, of talking about racism, shame around the topic of race. Uh, but many of our students today, our, our kids believe that they're different than their parents. And so I think we should engage them in their conversation. So one of the first things I would say, is start having the conversation, right? And if you're not clear, you can help by just asking questions, right? And that's one of the main things that can be useful in these conversations. So if you hear your, your, you know, your, your, your one of your children uh, say something that you're not clear about, say, say, what did you mean when you said that? Help me understand and have your, your, you know, your, your student elaborate a little bit. Have your son or daughter tell you more about what they mean. Or say, can you explain your thoughts on why you have that particular stance and why you would say such a thing, right? The more we probe and ask questions, I think better, right? So sometimes, you know, what students will say or what our kids might say is my family talks about X, but it sounds like your family is different, right? Kids are talking to each other about these issues all the time. And I think it's important for us to interrogate into understanding where they're hearing their opinions who's informing their opinions, and how we can perhaps begin to help shape and frame some of this, the discussion as well. Or I maintain that one of the big things we can oftentimes say is if we're ever unsure about something or unclear about something, is basically say, tell me more. I'm not following. Can you please elaborate? Can you please explain? Because this is all about us trying to learn from them before we begin to sort of insert our opinions, okay? And that's a big part of this conversation. So what I want to walk through now are really what I maintain are seven important, important steps that we can have that will help us to begin these conversations. And I'm going to take a pause after the first two to kind of engage some of the questions in the Q&A, okay? So uh, tip number one, uh, listen, folks, there is no perfect way to have the discussion. 
So if you're looking for the perfect day, the perfect time, the perfect setting, the perfect situation, uh, the perfect location, uh, the certain the, the way that the sun is setting or where the moon is sitting or the kind of moon, it's not going to happen. Part of what I say is when these conversations come up, let it be organic. Let it flow and let it go because it's oftentimes at the moment that you at least expect it, that's that your son or daughter raises a question or makes a comment or says something to you. And oftentimes we tend to want to shy away because we don't have a prepackaged answer, but there are no such thing as prepackaged answers. Part of what I think we have to do is recognize that these conversations can be messy at times. They can be emotional at times. In many instances, let's just recognize this. You may have very different thoughts and opinions than your children do, and that's okay because I think that opens up the door for a healthy discussion. They need to hear why you feel the way you feel. You need to try to understand why they have come to the conclusion that they have come to. And part of what we have to do is recognize that this is just sort of the ebb and flow, the back and forth, the give and take of having these conversations. They're not one-time conversations. They are ongoing. And part of what we have to recognize is that sometimes these conversations come up when we least expect them, right? I say look for the proverbial teachable moment. Right? We have so much going on in the world today, news, politics, uh, sort of social issues, which we'll get into in a moment, that really will kind of force us to have to start having some conversations where we want to hear what our kids are thinking. They want to hear what we're thinking. They want to know what we think and believe. Are we as sort of progressive in some areas? Are we more conservative in other areas? And part of what we have to recognize, there's no right time, there's no right day. When the conversation opens up, go with it go down that pathway and see where it leads. Because again, you could be amazed at how much our kids can inform and enlighten us, okay? So that's tip number one, no perfect way to have the discussion. As Nike says, just do it, right? When it happens. Tip number two, I think is an important one. Um, it's okay not to know everything, right? I think for us as parents and caregivers, we like to see ourselves as individuals who are all knowing that we can pretty much cover all topics in some kind of way, shape or form. And in some cases, our, our kids see us in the same way. They think that mom or dad or our, our, our you know, grandma, grandpa, whoever it is, is really smart and is really all knowing. But guess what? In some areas, we just don't know. And it's okay to say, I don't know. And it's okay to say, I'm not sure. And I think it's even better to say, you know what? Well, let's find out together because part of what these conversations can be about are exploring you know, certain things, for example, like, okay, I can't understand, and this is what I hear all the time. I've heard lots of white parents who said to me, you know what, my son or daughter brought home the issue around the N-word, how black kids use the N-word, but as white kids, we're not supposed to, how is it that there seems to be two sets of rules? And I see parents, white parents are stumped like, you know what, and try to explain something that just really doesn't seem very thought out or coherent. How about just say, I just don't know. Or in that case, when it comes to things like the N-word, I always say this, listen, there are just some things that certain people shouldn't say. I'm of the belief that nobody, no, no minor should be using the N-word. Black, white, red, blue, green, no matter what your color is. That's this Tyrone Howard's take. However, I do understand the argument that some Black people make that says, look, if we choose to repurpose and reappropriate the word and we choose to use it in a way that's a term of endearment, then that should be all right. Okay, I don't agree with that, but I respect that stance. But I always tell my white friends, listen, there are some things that we just can't say. And some people say, well, that's not fair. If they can say it, why can't I say it? And here's the example I frequently give. Um, my wife, who I've been married to for 29 years almost, we have pet nicknames for each other, right? I'll call her babe, I call her honey. Um, but let's be clear about something. If I ever heard somebody else call her babe or call her honey, we got a problem because that's a name that's reserved for me to call her. That's our word, that's our term, that is exclusive to us. Nobody else can use it to her. No one else can use it towards me. Much in the way with the N-word. I always tell folks with the N-word is highly contestable, highly controversial. I don't think it has a place, I don't use it, but I do honor and recognize the people who believe that they should be able to have ex exclusivity to it. So sometimes just say, I don't know. 
I'm, look, let's talk about it. Let's try to figure it out because that way at least you are showing your degree of vulnerability to say, you know what? There are some things that are just hard to wrap our heads around and racial sort of discussions are full of these kinds of uh, terrain that can be quite confusing, uncertain, and it's okay to say at times that we don't know. Tip number three, before we kind of delve into some of the questions. Listen, uh, this is something that helps us out more than we recognize. Today's young people, your children, my children, our children are much more comfortable with diversity than we were at the same age, okay? Believe you me, they are because they are much more at ease in talking and thinking and learning because for many of today's young people, being woke uh, means not being racist. It means not being homophobic. It means not being transphobic. It means not being discriminatory. There is a commitment and there is an overall social consciousness that this generation of young people have that's at a much higher degree than we've seen in previous generations. The data that we're looking at on youth attitudes and beliefs is telling us that. That works to our advantage. Our young people are trying to show us that they're not racist, that they're not scared of diversity, that they're not uncomfortable with people who are different. I think that's the beauty of this generation and in some ways, while we may not recognize it, we have contributed to that. We have opened up a space for them to talk, for them to learn, for them to listen uh, about the fact that, look, there are issues around them that they want to be on the right side of historically. Uh, there are stances that they want to take that they believe are more about inclusivity. There's a way in which they are thinking about diversity that we have not thought about, even as adults. I think that this tip right here works to our advantage because I am seeing more young people than ever between the ages of 12 to 18 who are engaged in some deep-seated discussions, intense discussions, borderline arguments with their parents and caregivers around issues around racism, around inclusion, around politics, around the environment, around justice, you name it. And I think in many ways, that's why we as the older folks have to be willing to listen and learn to our students because they can tell us a lot of things that perhaps we have not thought about because they are living in much more diverse settings in some ways than we did at their ages. And I want us to be mindful of that, okay? So I'm gonna kind of delve real quick into some of the questions. Dr. Ramirez, do you wanna pose them or should I jump into them on my own? I have some questions for you. Um, so what are some ways that parents can expose their children to positive, realistic images of people of backgrounds that aren't well represented in their community? It's great, great question. Uh, listen, um, I think it's 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 oftentimes a matter of us having to be intentional at putting our, our our kids in spaces where they're going to interact with young with people from diverse backgrounds. We live in Los Angeles, California, where prior to COVID and COVID has put some obvious restrictions on us, where you are hard pressed not to be able to find any place you can go to. So look, I mean. I love taking my children to Koreatown. We've been to festivals in Koreatown. We've been to plays in Koreatown. Uh, we've been to uh, different kinds of sort of uh, a spoken word events that have happened there. Uh, we've been, we were just, just, just my daughter and my wife and I just about three weeks ago went to a little Ethiopia in Los Angeles County because there's a large Ethiopian community there, businesses, uh, cultural museums. Uh, for years, my wife and I would take our, our kids to the Museum of Tolerance because we wanted them to understand uh, what was happening to, to Jewish people in this country and how anti-Semitism is still rampant today. We have to be intentional in a place like Los Angeles where there's so much culture, there's so much history that's all around us to go seek it out. We can't just be comfortable and stay in our own homes and our own communities and think that these issues are just going to fall in our lap. There's too many things that are out in our, our community. We spend time at Little at, at Olvera Street where you understand the history of the, the Latin influence on Los Angeles, or even just the, the term Los Angeles in terms of the historical understanding of how this, this city that we, the county we live in was once a part of Mexico and how that sort of changed over time. We have to be intentional. And if we're not clear there, now you can go online, there's movies, there, there are uh, documentaries. We just have to get a look. You can ask your, ask your students, go online, find something that helps them, type in something about where we see more positive representation of particular groups and you have more than you could ever imagine, but it requires some effort and some work, but you can find them. Excellent. So 
I think this person is very interested in having conversation with their children. So how do we discuss stereotypes with children who may be unfamiliar um, about stereotypes and they wanna talk about them without reinforcing these perceptions by introducing them? Yeah, that's another excellent question. Look, here's what we know about stereotypes. Stereotypes are stereotypes because there is a kernel of truth in all stereotypes, a kernel of truth. The problem is when we take that kernel of truth and we generalize it to an entire group of people. So I think that part of what we have to do is when we hear our kids say some things or if we if we want to introduce them to them, I think we have to do it very cautiously and carefully. Right. So, you know, you might say, listen, I remember some years ago, my son made a comment when he was about eight years old um, about certain foods that he said Asian Americans eat. And I said, well, where did you get that from? He said, well, because when I'm at school, my friend Eddie, he brings uh, this kind of food all the time. I said, okay, well, Eddie is, is, is Korean American and that's what he eats. I said, but you also have another friend named Kehoe. Does Kehoe eat the same thing that Eddie eats? And he had never thought about that before. He said, well, no, I don't think so. So I said, okay, well, Eddie may eat that, but that doesn't mean Keo does. So you can't say that about all Asian Americans or all Korean Americans, right? So part of what we have to do is begin to explain to our students, our, our, our children, about sort of the dangers of stereotypes, the dangers of assuming something about an entire group of people, because that can be so, so, you know, disrespectful and, and, and at times. I think we have to have them understand, what if somebody said, well, all people with blonde hair are blank, right? And you have blonde hair. How would you feel if that was being directed towards you, right? Are all people whose parents do X kind of work must think blank? I think we have to walk them through it, talk them through it, help them to understand the problem with taking a singular case and sort of generalizing it to an entire group of people because that's what stereotypes do. We paint with this broad stroke a group of people and make them out to be something that they're not. I think we have to explain it and then personalize it. How would you feel if a group that you're a part of, everybody thought everybody in that group had this particular behavior or this kind of belief or this kind of, this kind of way of seeing the world? That's where we have to try to personalize it because then uh, our younger ones can understand it. Excellent. Okay, so what, maybe one, one or two more questions, you let yes. me know. Yes. Um, so this is a great question. How do you control the unintentional part of how someone receives something? And how do you learn and grow if you can't have those conversations? It's the unintentional way that we may not even know that we've offended someone. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Um, thank you, anonymous attendee, uh, for that question. Um, now we're, we're delving into an area that I refer to as microaggressions. And I think microaggressions are a fascinating topic because microaggressions are like these subtle comments that are like slights, digs, put downs. Um, sometimes they're meant to be complimentary, but oftentimes they're quite harmful. And here's the thing we know about microaggressions, right? People can sort of say something that's inappropriate and you don't know that it's inappropriate. So at the end of the day, you can't ever control how people are going to receive your comments, but you do have to be thoughtful about your comments, right? And you have to, you know, and sometimes we make these, these comments sort of in a mistake, you know, in a mistaking way. Uh, part of what we have to understand is that, you know, as we're trying to understand certain things, um, we can say some things that are deeply troubling. So for example, uh, I have a colleague of mine and she was making, we were talking about a particular school in South LA. And she said, yeah, she said, those people are, she, those people down there have no idea what they're doing in terms of trying to control their own neighborhoods. And I just found that to be highly troublesome because I come from a neighborhood not too far from South LA. And to sort of talk about those people have no idea about how to control their own neighborhoods to me was deeply troublesome. So to me, I had to make a decision at that moment. Do I just let this comment go? Or do I say something to my colleague, right? And oftentimes these comments come up and we typically, we feel uneasy, we feel awkward, we feel uncomfortable, and we don't say anything. Um, but then when we do decide to speak, we have to explain it. And so the person who makes the comment oftentimes doesn't know that they've said something that's inappropriate. So sometimes you just don't know. And I think that really what it comes down to is we have to be, if we're on the receiving end of an uncomfortable conversation, or we're on the receiving end of an inappropriate comment, we have to let people know. Because I would be willing to bet all of you here who are with us today, at some point in time, you've been a part of a conversation where someone has said something that was really a bit unsettling for you 
or a bit unsettling about a group that you're a part of, right? Or, 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 or part of your identity. And sometimes we just kind of just grin and bear because we don't want to seem super sensitive or overreactive. But I think that if we don't bring that to people's attention, we never know. So I don't think you can hold people accountable for making comments that they don't know are offensive or hurtful or, or, or disrespectful or rude. But I ask all of us just to think twice before we make some of the comments that we say, because if, it, if we're ever having any kind of sort of uncertainty about it, maybe that's our sort of our, our filter saying, maybe you shouldn't say that, or where does that thought come from? From, or why am I making that comment? Because it can be very rude or disrespectful to someone. So we have to be careful about that. And I think that's so common. Sometimes we say things and we don't know that we've said something that's hurtful. Um, we don't know that somebody took our comment in, in a way that was sort of, you know, um, uh, out of line. And I'll say this, even if we don't intend to, because I think we cannot conflate intentions with impact. Just because our intentions were sincere doesn't mean that we still can't hurt somebody with our words. And so if we ever think we have, I think what we should do then is come to that person and say, you know what, did I say something that was inappropriate? Did I say something that was perhaps a little bit uncomfortable? Ask if you feel a bit of angst and that way you can at least begin to hear and learn from the person that may have been on the receiving end of such a comment. Fantastic, one more? Yep, one more, then we'll jump okay. back in. Um, how do you, so this one's referring to a teacher, but I think this could be any person, right? How do you kindly help a person who means well, but isn't aware of their white privilege, fragility, understand bias in the classroom? Yeah, you gotta, you gotta develop your courageous muscle. You gotta, you gotta talk to them because people who don't know, don't know, right? And for many whites, not all, for many whites, Robin DiAngelo has talked about white fragility, like this, this idea that when issues of race come up, people get defensive, people get scared, people get uncomfortable, and they'll say, how dare you, you know, you're, you're just overreacting. One of my best friends is Black. I went to college with a, with a Mexican woman, so I'm, I'm not that person, right? And I think we have to be willing and courageous enough to have conversations with folks who make comments. Uh, we have to be courageous enough to say, let me explain to you why that could be considered uh, you know, offensive to somebody because of this, that, and the other. I think far too often, and we're all guilty at times, if I'm being frank with you, I've been guilty. There are folks who make comments and we're just stunned and shocked that they would say such a thing that we just don't know what to say and we don't know how to react. And so we just kind of continue business as usual. And then, you know, two days later, three in the morning kind of hits you, you know, I could have said this and I should have said that and I should have responded in this way. But part of what we have to do is recognize that people who make comments like that, we have to help people be better because I would hope someone would help me be better if I made comments. Sometimes our kids make those comments. And when our kids make those comments, we have to say, whoa, 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 pump the brakes. Where does that comment come from, right? And how would you feel if someone made that comment about us? Or somebody said that thing about your, your mother or your father or your grandmother or your grandfather. So when we hear it, we just have to kind of stop being so, you know, PC that we're not willing to say that certain things are disrespectful, harmful, and can cause injury. Because if we don't, people think that it's okay to continue to engage in that kind of behavior. Thank you. All right, let's keep going. We got four more tips and then we'll open up for some additional Q&A. We're going to get a little deeper here, folks. All right, so tip number four, and I talked about this before, um, be a role model. You know, one of the biggest ways you can tell your, 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 your young ones about how you feel about diversity is to look at your circle of friends. Uh, who and what does your circle look like? If your circle of friends largely looks like you, then the message that you're sending to your teenager is that, you know what, um, diversity is something I say that matters, but I look at my friendship group and it doesn't really reflect that, right? And for us living in a county such as Los Angeles, and I know in Palos Verdes, there's, there's, you know, you can say there's a lot of racial uh, homogeneity, but it's not that much. There's diversity there. We have to ask ourselves, you know, what's the message we send when we get together with friends? Are those friend groups diverse? Uh, when we get together with people that we enjoy being around, is that group diverse, right? The more we have cross-racial friendships, the more we have cross-racial relationships, it sends a powerful message to our young ones that, look, diversity matters because I believe in coexisting and, and connecting with people regardless of their racial or ethnic background. Uh, I always say, too, let's look at our, like, especially at the high school, in the middle school, let's just take notice of 
the friendship groups that are on our campuses. Uh, I maintain in some cases, sometimes our friendship groups are highly segregated racially, right? I think one of the few places where you see much more racial integration tends to be in our sporting teams, because in our sports teams, we see much more racial diversity. But then ask your kid, like, wow, I mean, does any, do, how come there aren't more uh, Asians in your, group, in, in your group of friends compared to what you have now. I hardly see any African Americans interacting with you. Ask the question, right? And your kids will tell you something like, well, I never thought about that. Or you know what? The, the black kids hang with the black kids. The Asian kids hang with the Asian kids. The white kids hang with the, Asian, with the, white, with the white kids. And the, 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 the Latino kids hang with the Latino kids. And just kind of take notice. Now, I think we're getting better in terms of that interaction across racial groups and racial boundaries. But again, part of what happens is that our kids tend to, in some ways, not all, but in some ways tend to model what they see us doing. So I ask us to be role models, okay? Now let's go to tip number five, okay? Let's get a little deeper here, folks, because this might cause folks to be a little bit unsettled, right? Um, here, um, being colorblind contributes to racism, okay? We need to recognize that, I'll say it again. Being colorblind contributes to racism. Some folks might say, well, what are you talking about, Dr. Howard? Isn't colorblind the way to go? Isn't that what we want to be, to not see color, just to see people for people? And I think we say that, and it has some really altruistic intentions behind it. But when you don't see race, you're basically saying that you don't see people's identity. You don't see them or you wanna erase part of who they are. And that's deeply, deeply troubling because it operates from the idea that a core part of who you are, I'm gonna just act like it's not there, right? An essential part of how you might identify, let's just erase it and say that it's not really in existence, right? And we can't do that because we live in a world that we are constantly reminded about our skin color, right? Uh, we are constantly reminded about our language we're constantly remi reminded about sort of the, the places that we are we may have come from or the histories that we're a part of. So part of what I tell folks is that, look, colorblindness would be a goal if we were truly in an, equal, in, in an equal society, but we're not. So until we reach that day of having true, full equality, we need to recognize that people of color have different sets of experiences and different sets of realities that need to be understood and need to be recognized. And another way to understand colorblindness it's, it's basically in saying in some ways that, you know what, let's act as if we all started from the same place. Let's act as if we all had the same opportunities. Let's act as if we had all the same advantages and let's just go. Knowing that for Latino people, for indigenous people, for Asian people, for black people, that's not been our reality here. And so part of what we cannot do is erase or diminish or exclude a core part of who people are. I raise this up in many ways, like I talk about issues around gender, which we study a lot too. I could not operate in the world and say, you know what? I don't even see people's gender. I just see people. That would be telling women, for example, in our society that a core part of who you are, a core part of your identity, let's just act like it's not there. Despite the fact that women live in a world where you have to constantly be mindful of your surroundings, of where you're going, is it safe, uh, am I alone? Uh, all the conversations we have with our daughters about safety and, and being careful and mindful, we say that because their being women matters. Their being young women matters because it's a matter of what can happen to them if they're not watchful, mindful, or aware of the circumstances. So just like we know that gender matters in terms of how, say, women experience the world, race matters in terms of how people of color experience the world. And we can't just say we don't see it because we do. And I'm not saying that we need to be fixated on it, but to acknowledge it and to say to our young people, yes, race matters, it's important. And when people of color talk about their racial experiences, believe it, listen to them. When kids say, you know what, this place just feels like it doesn't respect me, don't try to talk them out of why they don't feel that way, honor that, hear them out, right? When kids say, you know what, oftentimes when we are in school and we try to form groups, I feel like none of the kids want me in their group, okay? That matters because in the eyes of that student, that it's important that you start to question, is it because I'm the only black kid at the, in, in the class? Is it because I'm the only uh, you know, Vietnamese kid at the school? Part of what people of color oftentimes wonder, am I being treated differently because of my race? It may not be, but that's oftentimes thought. Much in the way that for some girls and women, if it's a predominantly 
male group, the thought is, am I being treated this way because I'm a woman? Am I being treated this way because I'm a young lady, right? So part of what we wanna recognize is that being colorblind contributes to racism because it attempts to say that we don't see a core part of who you are and we wanna act as if it's not there. So please, please work hard towards not being colorblind, okay? Let's go deeper, tip number six, okay? Uh, might cause some folks to be uneasy, but this is what we all need. Discuss current events, folks. Why? Because your kids are talking about them and they're talking about them often. And they oftentimes are wanting to hear what we have to, what we have to say about these current events. And just in the last year, there have been a ton of them, a ton of them that have racial undertones that are just primed for us to have these conversations with our kids. This is the reason why we need to have these discussions because our kids are having the conversations with one another. And sometimes the way that they talk about it may not be the most appropriate and they need adult sort of supervision to raise the, que to raise the questions and to ask about the thinking. So let me walk you through a couple of current events just in the last year or so, maybe a couple of years and think about whether or not you had conversations with your high schooler, middle schooler about some of these topics. Okay, let's go here. This was a big deal within the past year. The death of George Floyd, the death of Breonna Taylor. What were the conversations that you may have had with your son or daughter around this? I hope that you engaged in some conversations about what happened to both of them, how it happened, that issues around the fact that they were both African-American and seemed to have lost their lives in a very unjust way. This is something that we saw lots of young people talking about, writing about. One of the things that we saw in a study that we did shortly after this, these events happened is that kids wanted to talk about these issues, but their teachers did not want to engage them in the conversation because they didn't want them to become political. I think that's a missed opportunity. I think that's a lost chance for some real rich dialogue. So this is where at home, we need to be the individuals who are having those conversations, right? How and why do we have these conversations about how there were so many protests around George Floyd's death? Uh, why and are we having conversations around the death of Breonna Taylor, how it happened, why it happened, and the series of other deaths that occurred at the hands of either law enforcement or everyday people uh, that, that led to the loss of life of black people, right? So I think you have to begin to say, let's have this conversation because this is unfortunate. You know, innocent people lost their lives, right? And it's just so happening that most of them that we see are black. Not saying that blacks are the only one who lose their lives, but this is a conversation that's rich, rich, rich for lots of perspective taking and lots of ways in which we understand them, okay? Let's go with another current event. Okay, how about this? For my sports folks out there, Colin Kaepernick became a lightning rod of controversy because of the fact that he had taken a knee during the national anthem. People thought this was either rude or disrespectful or out of line. It's, it's, it's disrespectful to our veterans. It's disrespectful to our flag. It's disrespectful to our country. Uh, there were a wide range of discussions around this. And Colin Kaepernick would say that he was doing this because he was standing up for police brutality, the end of, of, of police brutality. And many people felt very much uncomfortable with this and said this was not peaceful protest. This was disrespect. I think talking to your young people about this, you'd be fascinated to hear what they have to say. They may be all for Colin Kaepernick. They may be against Colin, against Colin Kaepernick, but the conversation is a rich one and a robust one. And I think we should engage our young people in this because they're having the conversation, okay? Let's keep going because we've had more topics in the last year that are warranted of our conversation. So if this is peaceful protests, how about what we saw on January 6th, is this peaceful protest? Because in many instances, look, our kids were telling us, I was, in a, I was in a classroom virtually just two weeks ago, two weeks ago, shortly after this happened, the insurrection on the Capitol. And the conversation came up around the ways in which Colin Kaepernick was vilified. He lost his career. He didn't get a new team because people thought that was a sign of disrespect. And that was a sign of him sort of not taking a stance that people didn't agree with, but yet we had a major set of protests that occurred in the Capitol just a few weeks ago. And young people are asking the question, how are we going to condone protests on one hand, 
but not condone, condone other protests on the other hand. Is, is there consistency? What does it mean that a Confederate flag is in the white, is in the, in the, is in the Capitol? What does the Confederate flag stand for? Uh, you talk about having a conversation. Our kids can tell us a lot about what they think about things such as the Confederate flag and if it has a place in our nation's capital, okay? Deep conversations. Our kids are talking about it. We should engage them in some conversation, okay? Let's keep going, okay? Uh, how about this one? Immigration. Um, you want to talk about some really, really sort of uh, intense conversations? Ask your kids about the whole sort of notion of illegal immigration, undocumented people in our society, building walls, people climbing walls, that's illegal, it's not right. All the stances that exist about that, right? I think it opens up a rich conversation to hear what your young people are thinking, to hear their perspectives. But again, part of what we oftentimes ask for is consistency. I'm bringing some, some images of what a teacher shared in the classroom with her teachers just last week around how do we sort of position this kind of behavior, what we see here, and juxtapose it with, again, what we saw in the Capitol building just three weeks ago. So again, we're talking about protests, we're talking about illegal actions, are illegal actions the same depending on one's skin color? Do the actions of one group sort of get a pass versus the actions of another group are much more likely to be criminalized? These are some heavy issues, folks, deeply controversial. But I think we have to recognize that our kids are thinking about them, they're talking about them. And I think that to some degree, we wanna sort of assess the temperature and tenor of where they're taking these conversations. These are the conversations we can have with our 13 year olds, our 14 and 15 year olds that we can't quite have with our five and six year olds. And again, this is where politics come into play and where your kids are, what they say. And part of what I oftentimes say, it's not about telling our kids what to think, but engaging in a conversation with questions and just raising some, some, some issues around, have you thought about X? Have you thought about Y? Did you consider this? Did you contemplate this perspective? And let kids come to their own conclusions about how they see these issues, okay? How about this one? This one caused a lot of controversy. How about Black Lives Matter? Um, do we discuss it? Lots of folks feel like, you know what? There is no place for discussing Black Lives Matter. Um, can't we say all lives matter? Um, black lives matter, does that mean that we're saying black lives matter more? Does that say that only black lives matter? We saw massive protests happening in our country over the past, what, year, spring of 2020, where we saw a wide range of young people, middle school age, high school age, across the racial spectrum, out marching, protesting the fight for Black Lives Matter. Some people are still uneasy with this. They say, you know, I don't like this term of Black Lives Mattering because why should we prioritize any one group over the other? And some folks would push back to say, well, is it really placing one group's sort of value in life uh, above another. And I would say, let's consider the comparison. Uh, black Lives Matter, is that saying that only Black Lives Matter? I use the comparison that says, well, what does this mean right here? How about breast cancer awareness? Uh, I think this is an important um, sort of public service call, awareness, lots of money, research that's been put out because we lose far too many women to breast cancer. But we embrace the notion of breast cancer awareness. But let's be clear, by talking about breast cancer awareness, does it mean that lung cancer doesn't matter? Of course not. Does it mean that prostate cancer doesn't matter? Of course not. Does it mean that any other cancer doesn't matter? No, it doesn't. But part of the focus is, when we're talking about breast cancer, we're talking about a particular type of cancer that has unfortunately and sadly uh, afflicted too many women and some small number of men in our society. And so just because we focus on breast cancer doesn't mean that we're not giving the time and attention to other forms of, ca of cancer. It's just that we're locking in and focusing on this type of cancer because something is happening around this particular reality. Much in the way I think we have to understand Black Lives Matter. Focusing on Black Lives Matter doesn't mean that other lives aren't important, doesn't mean that other lives matter, but when we're seeing far too many Black people dying unjustly innocently in an un unarmed fashion, it raises the question around what we do to focus here. So I think these are the kind of conversations that we must have. And they go deeper, folks. I mean, look, I mean, our political spectrum has not helped here. I'll say that 
Our political spectrum has not helped here. We are in the midst of living through a pandemic that has been brought about because of coronavirus. Our previous president said things that I think were highly inappropriate. And what we saw, and we have to be consistent with this, is that as we talked about the coronavirus being seen as this Asian thing, that's the sort of the language that has been used, we saw what? And in significant increase in the last year in the number of anti-Asian assaults, harassment, hate crimes. As coronavirus spread, people were taking some of the language that was being spread in the political realm and using that as a way to continue to sort of paint pictures of Asian Americans that were very, very ugly, very, very discriminatory. We have to have these conversations because again, our kids are having the conversation. I think we owe it to them to engage in the discussion because they are having them. And I think we can learn a lot from them. Are these easy conversations? Of course not. Are they necessary? Absolutely, because the environment and the ecosystem that we're living in is sending lots of messages to our kids that oftentimes are deeply troublesome, okay? So, and tip number seven, I would argue, Folks, keep talking, keep talking. The conversations are not one-offs. They're not one-time deals. I maintain that we're not gonna get all these issues covered in one discussion or two discussions. But look, sometimes what's helpful, sit down at the dinner table, turn off the TV, and let's just talk. Let's just have conversations about what we see in the political arena, things that are being said. Part of what I think we have to understand and part of why I think the conversations can be so rich. And let's take a topic such as immigration. Uh, I say this often because there's, not, there's a lot that's been written on this topic. We look at immigration in ways that are oftentimes centered around criminalizing certain people in this country, namely people who are Latino, right? But part of what I oftentimes ask all of us to think about is that racism in this country as far as we know it today, as far as most of the way we see it, tends to affect people of color more than anybody else. But if we were in this country 100 years ago, 1920, 1921, we saw a wave of immigrants who were coming to this country. And most of those immigrants were white immigrants, European immigrants. They were coming here from Ireland, Italy, Germany, Scotland, Poland, all seeking a better way. And those European immigrants face intense racism, intense scrutiny, intense uh, prejudice. And part of what we have to do in this country is not sort of have this collective amnesia. We need to understand and talk to our young people if we're white about what our grandparents and great grandparents may have gone through as they came to this country seeking a better opportunity and seeking a better way. I think oftentimes we condemn one group of people for trying to find a better way for themselves, yet that was oftentimes the very same steps that are being taken by previous generations. We have to recognize that out of the idea of e pluribus unum, which is a big sort of theme of our country, out of many comes one. And part of this conversation is talking to our young people, giving them some perspective taking, raising important questions, asking essential ways of looking at real hard topics around us because in so many ways, we have to recognize that our young people are seeking clarity on some of these issues. They're looking for answers. They want us, the parents, the older people to really give some guidance. And let's be clear, sometimes we're not going to see eye to eye, but that doesn't mean we can't have healthy, productive discussions. And sometimes we have to be okay saying, you know what, we're gonna to have to agree to disagree. But I can tell you that in the years, in the last five to seven years, the conversations I've had with my own children have given me some new understandings have raised my questions. I mean, my, my daughter will say, dad, you know what? You can't use that kind of language. You, have, you can't say that. That's just not, that's not, that's not what we do. And I have to hear that because again, I think that our young people are in it. They are, they are, they are engaging. They are, they are sort of informed. They are much more socially conscious around these issues than maybe some of us are even in our adult ages. So key here is keep the conversation going. Don't stop it have the conversation, read, reflect, have conversation with others. But this is what we have to do. I think we owe it to our students and I think we owe it to them to be better as we have these discussions. So let me pause there, see if we can answer some more questions. Okay, so 
Um, anonymous attendee says, thank you for this talk. You mentioned white fragility earlier. Do all whites experience this? Same goes for white privilege. Trying to understand how and if I need to keep this in mind with all future interactions. Great question. Uh, first part of the question. No, not all white people ex uh, sort of experience or engage in white fragility. Many whites are very comfortable and very at ease in having conversations about race, thinking about race, uh, and, and open to the possibility of even hearing different perspectives about race. That's what we want. People who are open and willing to have these conversations. White Fragility, which is I think is a must read by Robin D'Angelo, says that when people feel really uneasy and really uncomfortable and defensive and hostile and guilty around conversations about race, that's where the fragility comes in. What Robin D'Angelo talks about is the fact that some whites just don't have what she calls the racial stamina to engage in these conversations. Like, you know what? Okay, we talked about race last week. Let's not go back there again. I maintain that, that when it comes to issues of race, tapping out is a privilege, uh, meaning that you choose not to think about it or talk about it is the privilege because from people of color, we have to think about it all the time because it's just our reality. So when we talk about privilege, yes, I do believe that white privilege is something that's very real. Lots of people take umbrage with that whole notion of white privilege. I've had lots of people, friends of mine, colleagues of mine who say, well, Tyrone, how can I have privilege when I grew up poor and I worked hard and my parents worked hard to get what they got? And that's the argument that I make is that let's be clear to have privilege doesn't mean that you didn't work hard to have privilege. doesn't mean that you didn't have to overcome adversity or obstacles. Privilege means that your hard work takes you farther than folks who don't have it. And in our country, Let's just be frank. Being white carries lots of opportunities and advantages that people who are not white don't have. Much in the way, like I say, that there's a thing called male privilege, that me being a man, there are privileges and there are opportunities and advantages that I have for no other reason than the mere fact that I'm a man that women will never get. Now, does that mean I haven't worked hard? No. Does that mean that I haven't dealt with adversity? No, but it means that my hard work will take me farther than it will for folks who are not men. And I've got to recognize it. I've got to be aware of it. I've got to try to think about how much do I open up opportunities for women who don't have opportunities? How much do I think about the ways that I need to step back and listen to other folks talk more? Because in these conversations, sometimes men tend to dominate the conversations. So I think the goal here is to always be mindful of our own privileges to be mindful of our own positionality. If you're male, you got lots of privileges. If you're white, you have lots of privileges. Let's say if you're even able-bodied, there are lots of privileges in the society compared to people who may have certain kinds of physical disabilities. If English is your first language, that's a privilege because this is a country that prioritizes English over all other languages. We can, we can keep going on. If you're heterosexual in this country, that's a privilege. Part of what we have to recognize is that white privilege is not the only type of privilege in our country, but it is one type. And I think the more we are mindful of our privileges and how it helps to create certain pathways for us and open up certain sort of options for us, that's the goal here. And the goal is to say, how do we begin to sort of open up those opportunities so that people who don't have those privileges can start to enjoy some of those same opportunities? I hope that makes sense. Yes, thank you. Um, can you tell us quickly the difference between cultural appropriation and cultural appreciation? Yeah, yeah, we get that one a lot. So I think what we want to be mindful of is that culture, cultural appropriation is essentially taking elements of other people's culture and claiming them as one's own, taking elements of people's sort of ways of being and oftentimes sort of commodifying them. So for example, I mean, there's this, this long history in this country around, let's say music. Uh, you've had, you know, black people, brown people who have been the originators of certain types of music, uh, the creators of certain types of music. And those music sort of approaches have been taken by others and sort of classified or called their own or music that has been seen and sort of co-opted and sort of looked at as other people's music without any recognition of where it came from. That's, 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 that's cultural appropriation or trying to somehow situate uh, people's sort of ways of dressing, people's ways of speaking uh, as, as something that is not authentically yours. I think cultural appreciation is something different. Cultural appreciation does one thing that's important here. It gives credit. 
it recognizes. It says this has a, a, a deep-seated reflection or deep-seated reality in a, a group of people's experiences. So for example, what I appreciate, for example, with the, the conversations that happen within the Jewish community is when the conversation comes up around the Holocaust, there's a term that many of us hear, never forget right? Never forget is something that is rooted in the Jewish experience tied to the Holocaust. So I've heard other people sort of use that phrase in other settings. And I'm like, wait a minute, never forget is, is got a different context and a different sort of orientation and a different ontology that shouldn't just be used on anything that's not really tied to something serious as, you know, the, 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 the atrocities that happened to Jewish people in this country. So if you're going to use never forget, give recognition and credit to the, 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 the source and the place where it came from and recognize what that means, right? Same thing when it comes to a multitude of aspects of Black culture, right? That in some ways, the very ways in which some Black people uh, express themselves, or sort of show sort of signs of survival or, or navigation are somehow taken, used by other groups as if it's theirs, but without, without any recognition, without any sort of acknowledgement that these are ways of being that came from the Black community, out of a Black struggle, out of a Black history. And that's important. I think it's all about recognizing, appreciation, acknowledging, and, and if anything, opening up the door so those folks who sort of celebrate those cultural norms get the, the kind of sort of uh, spot light or get the kind of sort of, you know, sort of the, 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 the placement to be able to see and hear and have their ways of knowing to be uh, really associated with, with their sets of experiences. And so I think there's a, a fine line there, but I think the biggest thing is acknowledge where these beliefs and thoughts and ideas came from, because to not do that is to somehow position them as if they are one's own when they may not be. Great. So um, this one is, it's hard for me to hear because it says, my child has been the target of racial slurs from other classmates, both in person and on social media. As a parent, what guidance can I provide my child on how to confront racism among his peers? So my administrator lens is like, go to the school. But I also realize yes. that when kids start <laughs> in intermediate and high school, like they do not want their parents to go to the school. So yes. How can we help um, our parent, right, have their child talk to their peers about, you know, how they're feeling about these, these comments? Yeah, you know, I, I really appreciate and can identify this one with this question because I think what we as parents don't seem to recognize is that um, as much as we have seen tremendous growth and progress of our young people, there are still some deeply problematic held beliefs amongst many of our young people because they learn them from home. They learn them from media. And the reason why this one really sort of re re resonates with me because my son um, talks now, he's, you know, he's out of college. He talks about some of the, the kind of bullying that he was subjected to when he was younger. And it breaks your heart as a parent. And it was racial. It was racial. It breaks your heart as a parent to hear, you know, your child talk about the ways in which they were bullied um, and made fun of in terms of the comments and the, the jokes and the innuendos that were racial. And so what I say now is like, well, why didn't you, why didn't you come to me and talk to me or your mom? Or why didn't you, you know, tell, tell a teacher or tell an administrator? And he said much of what you just said, Lindsay. He says, you know, well, because that's just not what you did. You just kind of just dealt with it. You kind of just, you just kind of, you know, you kind of just not let it bother you. Because if I had told you about all the times I heard these comments or these jokes or these, these offhand comments, you would have been at the school every day. Um, you would have been there angry and upset. And I just didn't want that. So what I would say to that is, on the one hand, you know, you want to tell your son, or daughter, to talk about it, to come to you, no matter how hard it might be that they should not have to suffer in silence. They should not have to struggle with these issues alone. So this is where we as parents have got to be much more observant, much more aware of patterns and behavior of our children. We know our children better than anybody else. They seem a little bit more subdued. They don't seem like they want to go to school as often. We need to start asking some questions because more of our kids are going through this than we realize. And social media has opened up an entire pathway for bullying to take place. We know that there's like two out of four kids, almost 50% of kids are bullied. And in the overwhelming majority of them never tell an adult. They never tell an adult. So this is where we have to start raising the question to our children, 
ask them if they've ever had comments directed to them that were hurtful. Uh, and they're not, not just racial, and much of it is, but part of what you have to do is really have to impress upon your kids that this is not okay. And that as your parent, it is your job, it's our job to do everything we can to protect, protect, protect our children, right? And that we have to, if we have to talk to administrators or teachers, other parents, that's what we'll do, right? And we just have to begin to, de we have to normalize sort of the approach of talking uh, about what we're going through. Uh, because far too many kids suffer. And sadly enough, and, and we're seeing this during the coronavirus, we are seeing spikes in the number of kids who are committing suicide for a lot of reasons. Some of it's bullying, some of it's just the social isolation, some of it's being disconnected. But we see that oftentimes when there are higher levels of social media consumption, and we're not really monitoring as adults, we don't know what our kids are being subjected to. So my, my, my advice to you, and this is what I wish I had done, is just ask on a regular basis. If your son or daughter is one of the few kids or in the minority as a racial, you know, if one of the few kids of, of, of color in a school setting, it's ask, you know, do comments get made about you? Do kids say things? Even if it's jokingly, that's still not okay. If there's indirect comments by teachers, it's not okay. And you have to let your kids know that if you ever feel uncomfortable with any comment that anyone has made, come talk to us. Let's figure out a way that we can address it so that your son or daughter doesn't feel completely kind of, you know, like awkward and uncomfortable because kids feel like I can handle it, I can handle it. But it's a lot for any kid to have to sort of carry that responsibility and that burden, that emotional weight of having to contend with the fact that they're being subjected to such incessant bullying uh, that can be deeply, 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 deeply hurtful. So I appreciate that. But talk to your, your child, uh, talk to the school, um, just make sure that you're not silencing this. You're not saying, you know, be tough, get over it. That's not the message that we want to send. We want to have this out in the open and to talk about it so that no, no, no child should have to be subject to that kind of, um, that kind of treatment. I would agree. And I would say in my experience as a former counselor and principal, I spent a lot of time with kids um, just helping kids understand the damage that they do when they make comments, right? Because sometimes they're just joking. Um, but I think it's important for, you know, the school to also assist in that if, you know, the parent and the child so choose to do that. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Here's one about current events. So um, teacher is asking, how can we respectfully explain the importance of discussing current events to a parent who is angry that we've talked about it in class? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, this one has come up a lot and I've worked with a lot of school districts around this very topic. Um, so, you know, some parents, and I, look, we're just going to be frank here, are are not so much of the belief that we don't want teachers talking about these issues as much as some parents feel like I want you to talk about these issues in a way that aligns with what I believe or what I think. That becomes the issue, right? Uh, and part of what some, some parents have said is, well, I don't think my kid should be talking about politics at all in school. Your job is to teach them. Well, guess what? A lot of what is taught in schools are about politics. We talk about wars, we talk about history, we talk about the environment, we talk about recycling, we talk about a lot of things have a particular sort of political bent. I think one thing that we can do educators is if you think that there is going to be pushback, I see more teachers now are doing two things. On the one hand, they're going to their, their administrators, their principals and say, hey, um, we're gonna be talking about this particular thing right now you know, how would you advise me to sort of make sure that I'm not really upsetting or angering too many people? So make sure your administration is aware of what you're doing. Uh, so that way they will have your back. And second, and perhaps most importantly, sometimes it's about sending a notification home and letting parents know that we're going to be talking about subject X. And I just want you to know uh, that we're going to engage in a discussion. So that way the parents are aware of it. And even then, let's be frank, even then, some, some parents are still not going to be comfortable with that because they feel like it's their place, it's their role to have those conversations with their sons or daughters. And, you know, I think sometimes schools and classrooms are giving parents the chance to have their kids opt out of conversation. But here's the thing. Sometimes these conversations come up so organically that you can't prep for them, right? Students are in a class and they make a comment uh, that's highly inappropriate. You can't say, okay, time out. Uh, you know, I'm going to send a notice home. 
to the parents and tell them that tomorrow we're gonna discuss this topic. I think as educators, we have a role and we have a responsibility to make sure that no student feels unsafe or unprotected in our classrooms. So when students make comments, which, way, which they will, that are racial, that are based on you know, body type or any kind of shaming, I think we have to respond in that moment and we have to let students know that that kind of language is not okay. I think we have to tell students that we're not gonna allow any jokes or innuendos to be made in our classrooms because part of what happens is that for kids who are in the minority, there's already this sort of hyper sort of visibility that you feel like, you know, especially now, for example, it's February, it's Black History Month, and I can't tell you how many kids, Black kids I've talked to who go to, let's say, predominantly white schools or predominantly Asian schools will say, you know what, first of all, we don't talk about it at all that being Black History Month. And if we do talk about it, it's like the teacher turns all attention to me and we talk about slavery and ask me, hey, what do you think about, you know, we, sh we can't do that, right? We can't make that child feel like he or she or they is the, uh, the spokesperson for all matters that are tied to issues around whatever the topic might be. But I maintain that, you know, the more we have relationships with parents to let them know we're trying to help our kids be critical thinkers, our goal is not to inundate them with what we think they should believe. We just want them to be critical thinkers. We want them to hear multiple perspectives on all these issues so that they can come to their own conclusions and own understandings about the things that are happening around them in the world we live in. Awesome, I do wanna be respectful of your time. So we have four more questions, but I didn't know how many more you wanted to answer. Yes, I'm good, let's keep going. Okay, okay perfect. Um, so for our schools in our community that are not as diverse, how do you speak about equity and incorporate race and other important topics? Yeah, I think we have to look at our curriculum. So what is it that our kids are reading about? What are our kids learning about? I mean, so much of our curriculum sends a powerful message about who's whose identities and stories matter and whose do not matter. Uh, what's, what's unfortunately the case, if you look at many of the textbooks and the novels and the stories that we hear in our classrooms, even at the middle school level and the high school level, it consistently tells the story largely of white people, right? How do we know this? Because the University of Wisconsin-Madison does this analysis of uh, school textbooks, school novels, school literature, and shows that overwhelmingly uh, kids are expected to kind of hear and read novels and stories that are from the perspective of white authors. Rarely do we hear, hear about the perspectives of people of color, from women, from members of the LGBTQ community. We have to look at our curriculum. We have to look around our school and let's say, look, what are the images that we have up on our walls? What are the images that we have in our hallways? Do they look inclusive? I think we have to say, even in a school where there's not much racial diversity, that's an even bigger wake up call to ensure that we are creating much more diversity in our curriculum, in our, in our, uh, in our hallways. Let's look at the makeup of who's in, in, in student government and leadership positions. I maintain we need to even look at who's in our AP and honors classes. Are we inclusive there? Are we trying to be thoughtful and intentional about incorporating kids who, again, who have earned the right to be there, but at the same time, if it's only of a particular race or ethnic group, we have to ask ourselves the question, why is that? So we, let's do some inventory around our schools and let's ask how can we be more inclusive? What opportunities are we affording? How do we talk to parents and caregivers to see what they say about how we can be more inclusive? And how about this one? How about we talk to those students of color who are oftentimes marginalized to ask what they think we can do to be much more inclusive? That's where we really hear some powerful answers. Thank you. I did. Um, I will say that I did take some time. We are actually planning an ethnic studies class. Um, so I did take some time to um, talk to kids and it was a very um, insightful and powerful conversation. So again, I think, you know, talking to students and talking to your children is, is such a powerful thing, right? Because you learn mm -hmm. so much. Um, and mm -hmm. it, it, because they oftentimes are having the same conversations that adults are having, we just don't give them a space to actually, you know, let it all out. So it was very great for me. Um, so there have been some uh, PV students who have used the N-word, one of which got national attention. We've talked about yep. this and one other yep. time that he was out of the classroom. So how do you suggest um, addressing this? So I don't know if this is from a parent perspective or from a school perspective, but I'm going to go with a parent perspective. Yeah, I, I, this is one of the topics that comes up time and time again. I think we talk about it and take it on head on. And I think that stance should be, we don't use it. It's an ugly word. It's a filthy word. There's no place for the word. I don't care who else uses it. I don't want you using it. That's what I told my kids. They're African-American. You don't hear me using it. You don't hear your mom using it. You don't hear your grandparents using it. We just don't use it. 
And the more we can be consistent with that, I think the better. Part of what kids get into, much like the adults get into, well, they use it in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the music and they use, I don't care, that's fine. If they use it there, you're not gonna use it. We don't use it. And I think we have to start cracking down more on, on school campuses where we can say there's zero tolerance for the use of the N-word. But I think it would help if that message is reinforced at home that we tell our kids, look, I don't want to hear that word. If you listen to music that has it, I don't want you to repeat it. We just have to be consistent that there's no place for the N-word for our kids. I think as we become older, you can't you know, censor what adults do, but when they are minors, I think no matter what color they are, the word should not be used, plain and simple. Thank you. And then question about how do we transfer the conversations with our children at home to address the systemic racism that exists within our school system? So maybe yeah. not PVP USD, but just in general. Yeah, so systemic racism is, is, is not just a Palos Verdes issue. It happens in schools across this state, across this country. Some people still struggle with what is systemic racism. And I always say, well, look at sort of the ways in which um, opportunity is afforded, right? Look at, look at who are in most of our, our AP and honors classrooms and ask why. Look at, you know, the, the ways in which, you know, if you look around Los Angeles County, the people who are experiencing homelessness happen to disproportionately be black and brown people. Uh, look at what happens in our schools and say, why don't we see more teachers of color? Why don't we see more administrators of color, right? Ask the question why, just to take inventory over what we're expected to learn. What are the classic books that we are sort of mandated to have to read, right? I think our kids are able to pick up on some of these systemic ways. And part of what I say, look, you can call me a name um, that's racially insensitive, but at the end of the day, I can let that roll off me if I choose. But what's harder to deal with is having structures in place that make it difficult for me to have access to say an AP course. Uh, what's difficult is when I look at the fact that uh, things like um, you know extracurricular activities uh, some people are told about them and other people are not told about them, right? Uh, systemic sort of it, it racism exists when we talk about the fact that we have a homecoming court. And for the last 10 years, it seems like there's hardly any people of color who are on the homecoming court. Why is that, right? To just ask some fundamental questions about do we bake into the way we do things with our policies and our practices that seem to give some students opportunities and advantages that others do not get. And then the goal becomes, how do we work collectively how do we work collaboratively to end it? Because there's no place for it. And that's where we as the adults have to be willing to have some hard conversations to say, let's take an inventory. Let's look at the students who we tend to suspend and expel and do certain kids get sent out of the office disproportionately for doing the same things that other kids are doing. Those are the conversations that we have to have. Do we give some kids a pass when they put up some racially inappropriate things in the bathroom or in the hallways? Do they get a pass compared to when other kids do something similar? They're punished in a much more harmful way. Let's just look around us. And again, you wanna find out where and how systemic racism may be happening. Talk to your kids of color. They will point out to you in real concrete and detailed ways how they see it and how they feel it. Awesome, thank you. Last question, if the culture of brushing aside this issue is as overreacting, um, so I think this goes back to the, how do you address it, you know, if something happens at school, if there's like a slur that's um, sent to a child, exists within the school, how can you expect parents or their children to bring these issues to the school? Yeah, so this is very common because what happens is, and this is the, this is the real challenge that lots of, not just kids of color, but adults of color face. Because you know, it takes a lot of courage to muscle up the, 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 the will to say, you know what, let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you why it was wrong. And the, the, the worst response you can get is to have it thrown back in your face to say, well, that's just not a big deal. Or you're overreacting. Or you know, let's just, just kind of get over it. I think when people bring these issues to our attention, believe in them, right? and let's try to somehow not sweep them under the rug. To sweep them under the rug is to say that their hurt is not important, that their pain doesn't matter, that the anguish that they might be experiencing is really not something that we care about at all. I maintain that if we, this is where the adults have to be better, be it parent or teacher or administrator or counselor, when any incident comes to our attention, that in any way, shape or form is, is racial or gendered or about one's gender identity expression or religious or about one's socioeconomic status, 
if that comment is made, we have to swoop in and deal with that with the us utmost serious. We just cannot have a climate that says it's okay to make these comments sort of okay. We cannot have a climate that says that, you know what, let's kind of look the other way. They didn't mean it that way. Let's get over it. Uh, we have to take them serious. And I think if we take them seriously, it sends a message to all of our students in our school community that there is a zero tolerance policy around hate. There's a zero tolerance policy around discrimination. And that's the kind of climate that we have to create. So if there is that sort of this brush it aside moment, I always tell parents, know the chain of command. Talk to a principal. <laughs> you don't get it from the principal. The principal has a boss. Go to your principal's boss, right? Talk to her or him or them. Keep going up the chain of, of the command. Talk to Dr. Gotanda. Talk to the superintendent. Go to the school board meeting. Keep going up the higher uh, chain of command. And here's the other thing I'll ask. One thing that I know school districts just don't want to see happen, and Dr. G, you can attest to this, is when certain kinds of ugly incidents get turned over to the media because that can paint a broad picture on a school and nobody wants that. So this is why we oftentimes tell administrators, look, let's deal with this now because if we continue to sort of sweep this under the rug, and if it gets into the media's sort of, you know, hands, it becomes a, it takes on a life of its own. We know there were ugly incidents that happened in Palos Verdes a couple of years ago. Uh, and that is just not the label that we want to have placed on our community. So let's not have that culture of sweeping over things. Let's talk about it. Let's deal with it. Let's take it seriously. No matter how minor it might appear to others, what might be minor to one person is a big deal to another. And we have to take it such. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then just one quick closing question. Um, do you have some go-to reads for our for our parents? If you know, I know we talked about white fragility, but are there other reads that they can start with? Yes, I should have put that slide, but I'm sorry. But uh, another one of my favorite books right now, and I've been using it for a while, is Racism Without Racists. Racism Without Racists by Eduardo Bonilla Silva. And what Eduardo Bonilla Silva talks about in that book is how colorblindness is, is, is deeply problematic and we should understand it and we need to recognize how it, it is complicit in perpetuating inequality. Color, I mean, uh, racism without racist is one that comes to mind. And if I had to add another one that I think is really powerful, um, Gary Howard has a series of works called, you know, we can't teach what we don't know, how white people deal with racism. Um, he has like four editions. Gary Howard, uh, We Can't Teach What We Don't Know. Uh, powerful, powerful book. And let me add one more, please. One more, please. If I can think about another, I'm sorry, Lindsay. Yeah, I knew uh, you I'm, do. I'm reading this one right now. I'm going to give it a big plug. My colleague, Danny Solorsano, and his, uh, and his colleague, Lindsay Perez Uber, called Racial Microaggressions. One of the best books I've read in a long time about understanding microaggressions, how to recognize microaggressions and how best to respond to microaggressions because we can all be guilty. And we're reading this in one of my classes right now and the students are truly loving it. So there's a couple. Awesome, thank you. Well, it is truly a pleasure um, to have you here and, and it's always really great for us to have these conversations, um, albeit you know, sometimes uncomfortable, sometimes difficult, but always mm -hmm. courageous. So mm -hmm. thank you very much, Dr. Howard, for your time. And thank you everyone for being here tonight. Um, we will also be having our um, elementary parent night next month. Um, so we'll be sending information about that and we will welcome Dr. Howard back for that um, last presentation. So thank you everyone. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. So very nice um, comments in the Q&A. Just thanking you. Good, good, good.